Um, so, uh, my talk is going to be about building for humans, not for computers. Um, and I think this has been covered by a lot of the panelists before us, the user experience of crypto sucks. We all know this. Um, some of us have been in this industry for a very long time, and we've kind of got used to MetaMask, and we've kind of got used to seed phrases, and we've kind of got used to all of the weird ways in which uh, it seems some of these applications seem to try and make things harder for people to use rather than easier to use. My favorite example of that is Curve. Um, but Radix is actually a platform that we've spent half a decade looking at the user experience of crypto, and we came to the conclusion that you actually had to throw everything away. Um, that's not just MetaMask. That's not just how people are currently designing UX. It's actually how you design the ledger itself. So no EVM. The EVM is terrible. No Solidity. Solidity is terrible. No MetaMask. MetaMask is terrible. And I'll talk you guys through what we learned as we were going through this process and why we ultimately decided to go a completely different path. I mean, the first aspect of this is good design is hard. Um, and one of my favorite books, The Design of Everyday Things, talks about this. And, and, and you, you get inured to the fact that every object around you has gone through decades, sometimes centuries of design to come to that perfect human interaction that we take for granted around us. And the reason that, this, that that happens is because we go through these layers of iteration. First, we come up with a new way of doing things. But that new way of doing things is hard. This, for those who don't know, is a uh, Bitcoin command terminal for a mining rig. Now, this is what most tech starts off looking like, command line. And it looks like this because this is the best UX for the people who are using it. As a developer, this is great. It's exactly what I need. It has all of the power that I need at my fingertips, and it speaks my language. And so everything that you see designed ends up starting by looking like this. However, there are some cardinal mistakes that have been made in how crypto has been formed and in how it's been presented to the everyday user. And some of these mistakes come from the very philosophy in the way crypto has been designed. And the mistake number one that we have seen from this, this five years of research and actually doing over a 1,000 user interviews and user design um, sessions is that the first mistake we've made is users must understand what a private key is. This actually comes from the philosophy in some ways, of the underlying what created Bitcoin in the first place. The, the, the cypherpunk manifesto created in 1993 ended up creating the uh, cypherpunk mailing list, which Satoshi Nakamoto was famously um, a big proponent of and part of. And this idea of privacy and the importance of privacy led to the importance of crypto and led to the tools that make it possible to build crypto. But then that sort of echoed into the idea of not your keys, not your crypto, where the idea of the key being the most important thing. Not sovereign control of the asset, but the key being the most important thing is what has pervaded in most of the designs we see today. That results in things like BIP39, where if we're actually honest with ourselves, no one is ever going to really be bringing seed phrases mainstream. Like this idea that I have to write down on a piece of paper my seed phrase, and that if I lose it, I lose everything. Complete inflexibility is not acceptable for a mainstream user experience. However, that's not the only cardinal sin that crypto has made so far. The second mistake was that digital assets equal smart contracts. Now, that wasn't actually how crypto started. Bitcoin, on Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself is not a smart contract. It's a native function feature of the ledger. And the ledger itself maintains the balances of Bitcoin. And Ethereum itself is not a smart contract, unless you're using ERC-20 wrapped Ethereum. But generally speaking, Ethereum is not a smart contract. It is a fundamental feature of the underlying ledger. However, what we did what crypto did, and what a lot of the people before me have spoken about, is this idea of my 
public key is my address, and then my address indexes to where my assets are held. But what everyday users expect, they don't expect that. When they go into MetaMask and they look at their balances, they're like, oh, my balances are in my wallet. But the balances are not in the wallet. Where balances actually are, are inside smart contracts. So what you have is you have these ERC20 contracts that maintain their own internal balances of tokens. This is actually where a lot of the hacks and exploits come from. It's also why sometimes someone will send you a token, and they'll go, did you get the token? And you'll look in your wallet, and you'll be like, nope. They'll be like, oh, I definitely sent it. Look, here's the block explorer. And you go, nope. And then they go, oh, you have to add a custom token to your wallet. You have to go into MetaMask, or you have to go into Trust Wallet, and you have to add this custom token. That's because the wallets don't understand what they need to look for until they're told what to look for, because the ledger itself doesn't understand what digital assets are. Only the smart contracts do. So what you're doing every single time you're loading up a wallet is the wallet's also going, well, what are all the tokens I need to be aware of? In fact, what are all the smart contract addresses that contain all the balances I have to care about to look up? Which means that you kind of have this never-ending problem of tokens not being supported when they're created until the wallet decides that that is a good token that they want to add. This ends up in the situation of, dude, where's my token? Like, and that happens more and more, especially in DeFi, when you're doing custom LP tokens or you're doing something more esoteric that can be created into great user experiences apart from the fact that the token doesn't even appear in their wallet. It's cardinal sin number two. And we started in the right place. The ledger keeps track of balances of tokens. And then we move to smart contracts keeps track of balances. And that's actually resulted probably in about $2 billion worth of hacks on its own. Mistake number three, transactions cannot be previewed. This means that I, uh, I go to a user interface, I go and ask it to do a bunch of stuff, and then it just goes, sign this hash. Cool. The thing is, is that on, in Web 2, the most important user flow, the number one most important user flow in all of Web 2 for e-commerce is the shopping cart and checkout flow. That's where most users are lost. That's where most money goes into it. It's part of the reason that Stripe is such a successful company. But more than that, it's why so many of these standardized paradigms you see in e-commerce end up being specifically in the checkout and order flow. Here, I've gone to a website. I've decided what it is I want to buy. Now I get to see line by line what is I am going to buy. And then I have a very clear way in which I understand I am, under con I am in control of exactly what I'm spending, what is I'm buying, and how I'm buying it. In crypto, we don't do that. In crypto, we don't actually really help the user at all. We kind of have a user interface that goes, these are the things I'd like to do. There is no stage in which the user can go review that that is actually what they want to do. MetaMask isn't helping them at all in telling them what application they're interacting with. Why indeed is the address up there and the address up there different? Huh? What, what am I expecting to get back? Is that transaction that I'm confirming actually going to get me the FRM token? Huh? When I click the bu button, how long do I have to wait? Oh, four minutes. Well, for the everyday consumer, that's absolutely terrifying. For most people, we're like, that's fine. I'm used to crypto. But for consumers, that's awful. So how do we fix it? Well, the answer to the first part of that question is you have to change the architecture of the ledger itself. You, you, you can't just fix Ethereum. You can't just fix the way the EVM works. You can't just fix the way the assets are created on top of public ledgers. You actually have to start again from scratch. But you can, instead of talking about the technology, we can talk about the basic principles. The first is self costy has to be forgiving. Now, Luxo was talking about this idea of abstracted accounts, and ultimately, this comes down to this idea of people fuck up. People make mistakes. Sometimes they lose their phone. Sometimes they lose their hardware wallet. Sometimes they lose their seed phrase. But ultimately, all of these things are based on the fact that people are fallible. You have to separate the idea of your public key and your private key being everything. But more than that, you have to give people optionality. You have to be able to say, OK, I have a standardized component on a public ledger that says, this is my account. 
And then I have ways in which I can add or remove devices as many as I want and as many rule sets as I want to be able to go, this is how I want to do recovery. This is how I want to have a backup device. This is a service that I want to rely on to be able to do that thing. The second part of this is digital asset ownership must be simple. When someone sends me a token, it always has to appear in my wallet. When I interact with the token, I always have to understand what I'm interacting with. I have to understand everything about what I see, and if I can't do that, then crypto can't go mainstream. So what you're seeing here is actually just leveraging the power of what Radix is built underneath. We didn't just build abstracted accounts as a component of the ledger. We also included everything like standardized concepts of tokens, standardized concepts of non-fungibles, standardized concepts of accounts of permission, standardized concepts of metadata, standardized concepts of transaction program programmability. And all of those things together mean that this is not the wallet having to go and understand what this metadata is. This is not the wallet having to add each one of these token types to the wallet so that the wallet will display it instead of the user having to go and ask for it as a custom token type. This is because the ledger itself is managing what it means to be a digital asset, which means that every single thing, regardless of how complex, intricate, or interesting the token type is you've created, is instantly compatible with every single wallet immediately and with every single smart contract. You also can have rich metadata around NFTs. You can do everything from ticketing to in-game items to insurance contracts to mortgages. All of these kind of things come through as rich metadata that instantly renders for the user. So it doesn't matter what application you're using. You will always have an intuitive user experience at the end of it. You have the ability to specify what kind of, what kind of tokens you can accept or not. You can block tokens. You can block all tokens if you want to. You no longer have to worry about spam on the network. You can also see all of the applications that you're connected to so that you can easily manage who has permission to do what, and you can do it directly within your wallet. But again, this is all leveraging components of the Radix ledger itself. These are all parts that are built into the underlying tech stack. The wallet itself is just a UI on top of that, which means that anyone can build these experiences, whether or not they're using the Radix wallet or not, on the Radix ledger. The last part of this is the user has to feel in control of transactions. Ultimately, we are talking about finance. Everyone's most scary topic when it comes to handling their money is at the point I transact, is the thing that I want to happen actually going to happen? Now, for everyone here who's used DeFi and Web3, you're going to be like, ah, you know, I click MetaMask and I wait four minutes, and it's just how it works. But for everyday people, you need to be able to see that preview. And this is why we, again, created the transaction layer of Radix. The transaction manifest is a fully programmable transaction layer that leverages the inherent uh, aspects of the, um, of the assets and the accounts and the permissions to let you see line by line what it is that you're about to do with the ledger. I can see I'm taking 20 uh, USD tokens out of my wallet. I can see that I'm interacting with the app RadiSwap. I can also see what I'm expecting to get back. Not only that, I can customize the guarantees. And I am in control of this. I say, if this does not return to me 32.786, 31.14 tokens, then I want the transaction to fail. I understand every single action I'm about to take with the money I care about, and I see it in human terms, and it happens within five seconds or less. And that is the only way in which we can make people feel safe when they use crypto. Thank you very much.